Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, very interesting discussion this morning and a very special uh, welcome to our guest of honour today. Um, you're not a stranger to Ireland uh, and it's wonderful to have you here at the IIEA. Just a few words about the format today. Uh, this is a hybrid event, so we have an in-house audience and we have an audience online. You're very welcome if you're listening online and especially to those who are joining us by YouTube. Feel free to follow the discussion on Twitter, if that's your medium, um, at uh, the handle uh, iiea.ie. Um, the presentation and the question and answers are on the record. And when putting a question, um, please identify your name and also any organization to which you are affiliated. Um, if you are joining us online, please use the Q&A uh, facility on your screen um, and we will come to the questions then uh, after the presentation. Um, the event today is part of the IIEA's Global Europe project and it is supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs. That I think is all of the administrative uh, work. And so it's given, it gives me a, a very great pleasure to introduce, although I don't think you need any introduction to an Irish audience, Svetlana Tishkanuskaya, uh, and she's already forgiven me for my pronunciation. Thank you. Um, you are the leader of the Belarusian Democratic Movement, uh, which contested the 2020 uh, Belarusian presidential election um, as the main opposition uh, candidate following the detention of your husband and our thoughts are with him to date also. Uh, since the disputed result of the presidential election, uh, you have become a symbol of the peaceful struggle for democracy and of strong female leadership. That has been recognized internationally and we are very pleased that you received the Tipperary International Peace Award this week. But that's only amongst many, many uh, awards that you have received, including the 2020 Sakharov uh, Prize for Freedom of Thought presented by the European Parliament. And also, uh, this is a long list, <laughs> but, it, but it's evidence of how highly you are thought of. And in 2022, you received the International Four Freedoms Award and the Charlemagne Prize. You have been recognized in Bloomberg's top 50 most influential people. The Financial Times top 12 most influential women and Politico's top 28 most influential Europeans. You are more than welcome and you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Mary uh, William for such kind introduction. Thank you, Mr. White, I don't see you. Oh, yeah, <laughs> for, for hosting us today, the excellencies, the friends, uh, good morning. Thank you for thank you for inviting me to uh, speak to you on these troubled days. First of all, I wish to thank Irish people for awarding me the Tipperary Peace Prize. This award means uh, a lot to me uh, personally, but also to my countrymen, especially now when Belarus is not so high on the world's agenda, as it used to be and actually should be. I take this award as the recognition of the Belarusian people's ongoing fight for freedom. I'm so pleased to come back to Ireland. Ireland is and will always be in my heart. I came here as a child and it made a huge impression on me. Here I learned many things. I saw what life in Belarus might look like. Ireland imp impacted my life and my views. I also see many historical parallels between our countries. Both our nations over the centuries were fighting for freedom and independence, for language and for identity. For us, this fight is still going on. Today, the situation in Belarus uh, is probably the worst since 2020. Our country is gradually losing its independence. The creeping, uh, the creeping occupation of Belarus is taking place. With Lukashenko's help, Putin is trying to establish full control over Belarus. All those who dissent and oppose are thrown to jail. Then they are humiliated and tortured. Just last week, the former presidential candidate, Viktor Babarika, was brought from prison to the hospital so badly beaten that the doctors couldn't recognize him. We are still lacking information about his condition. 
he's one of the dictator's main rivals and he suffers Lukashenko's revenge. There are so many others suffering the same fate because they raised their voice for freedom. And we are demanding to allow his family and Western diplomats to see him to make sure that he is alive and healthy. Yesterday on World Press Freedom Day, the regime celebrated by sentencing three journalists to up to 20 years in prison for doing their job. Two were sentenced in absentia. The third, Roman Pertasevich, has been held by the regime since uh, they hijacked a Ryanair flight uh, bound for uh, Vilnius in 2021 to capture him and his girlfriend. Lukashenko state terrorists risked uh, many lives on an international flight just to arrest Raman. Unfortunately, despite the malicious violation of international law, the regime was never punished for the hijacking of the plane. Neither have the judges who take part in the prosecution of journalists and thousands of others in, imprisoned for political reasons. Now I ask you to imagine waking up in a small dump cell in a KGB prison from Soviet times, where the smallest mistake or wrong word can give them an excuse to submit you to the most inhuman torture. No matter how many years they gave to you, it won't make any difference, as they will just add more years on the top of it if they want to. Recently, the son of my representative on constitutional reform, Anatoly Libetka, was detained and, they, and the, they started a criminal case against him, and it is poor revenge. For all those innocent prisoners in the dark cells, we are the only hope. We have to continue the fight every day for their release. Every day for us in freedom is another day of suffering for them. People are, uh, people are detained and imprisoned on a regular basis. On average, 17 people every day. Among them, journalists, students, teachers, doctors, even government officials or military who supported the protests in 2020 and stood up against Putin's invasion of Ukraine. The KGB infiltrates online communities trying to trace and punish all the dissent. Human rights defenders already lost, lost count of how many prisoners are in jail. We know the names of 1,500, but the real number is more like uh, 5,000 people. There are at least 25 senior citizens among them and 74 people have disabilities and serious, serious illnesses, including cancer, diabetes, asthma, epilepsy, and mental health problems, and they don't receive proper medical treatment. The oldest Belarusian political prisoner that we know uh, is Natalia Taran. She is 75 years old, and she's serving a three and a half years prison term for insulting officials. For a month already, I have not heard anything from my husband, Sergei Tikhanovsky, sentenced to 19 and a half years in jail. His new lawyer is not allowed to see him. It seems the regime now has extra torture for political prisoners, as well as denying them warm clothes, uh, proper bedding and medical care. Now they deny them information. Lawyers have become the latest targets. Those who defend political prisoners are often jailed. In Minsk, in Minsk, for example, it's already impossible to find a lawyer to represent you in a political case. Besides intensified repressions, we see another trend. Propaganda media begin to dominate the informational space. They spread anti-Western and anti-Ukrainian narratives, justifying the war in Ukraine. They try to convince Belarusians that Russian nuclear weapons are a good thing for the country while the absolute majority of Belarusians are strongly against it. Today, we are witnessing the creeping occupation of Belarus by Russia. Last year, Lukashenko allowed the deployment of Russian troops and enabled the Russian assault on Ukraine. Now, he continues to send to Russia weapons, ammunition, armor, and vehicles. He provides Russia with training facilities and military bases. Up to 5,000 Russian soldiers are stationed in Belarus. They rotate regularly. 
after training their sent to fight against Ukrainians. Lukashenko is Putin's puppet. He follows every order. Last month, Lukashenko met with Pushilin, a pro-Russian separatist leader. The submissive dictator has to constantly demonstrate his loyalty to Putin because without Putin's support, he will lose power overnight. In March, Putin and Lukashenko announced plans to deploy nuclear weapons in Belarus. This would be the first spread of nuclear weapons in Europe since the non-proliferation agreement. And we must, we, must know, uh, we must not allow this to happen. It is a great threat to regional security, but also because it means a Russian control over Belarus for years to come. It directly violates our constitution. However, it's crucial to differentiate between the Belarusian people and Lukashenko's regime. Belarusians demonstrated their clear stance. We are against the war. We do support Ukraine. According to the polls, 86% of Belarusians are against participation in the war. It also makes the uh, Belarus situation very different from Russia, where support for the war is evident. Street protests, as we saw in 2020, are impossible right now in Belarus. So our resistance went underground. Hundreds of thousands joined the partisan movement. In 2022, uh, only more than 80 acts of sabotage uh, took place on railways to stop the advance of Russian troops. Also, we do all possible to keep democratic uh, uh, forces united. Last year, we created the United Transitional Cabinet, uh, which works as the government in exile to coordinate the activities of Belarusians in exile and inside the country. Cabinet members are working with Belarusian military volunteers in Ukraine, families of repressed civil society groups. Our goal is to have legitimate representative body which represents Belarus and Belarusian people on the international arena. And I'm glad to see that uh, more and more countries and international organizations are working with us, but not with the criminal regime in Minsk. Last year, we established the formal contact group in the Council of Europe, while representatives of the regime were kicked out from this organization. Another important direction of the cabinet is to strengthen the national identity. I don't need to explain it to Irish people. There is an ongoing attack on Belarusian culture, language, and historical memory. We mustn't allow Belarus to be uh, turned into a Russian province or colony. And strengthening Belarusianness is a key priority for us. So dear friends, you know, I would like to share uh, the key points of our efforts in the future. And I hope for your advice actually, but also your help uh, for its implementation. First, keeping Belarus and the political prisoners in the world's agenda we must make their release our common priority. Organizations such as the UN or OSCE can be more active in this direction. Second, the sanctions enforcement. Sanctions aim to weaken Lukashenko's and Putin's regime, but also to split elites around them. However, sanctions do not work in full due to loopholes. The regime circumvents sanctions through Russia and other countries. Third, prosecuting Lukashenko and his cronies via existing mechanisms or uh, creating new ones. We ask to establish the international tribunal not only against Putin, but also against his crony Lukashenko. He has a long record of crimes, crimes against humanity, hijacking the airplane, orchestrating migration crisis, complicity in, uh, complicity in war crimes. Uh, fourth, supporting the Belarusian democratic movement. It's crucial to help Belarusians in exile and provide assistance to our media and civil society. And fifth, provide a positive alternative to Belarusians. We have to promote the European choice for Belarus as an alternative to the Russian world. Belarusians should know that they are welcome in Europe. So I do believe that changes in Belarus can become can come sooner than changes in Russia. 
changes in Belarus would be a, a great contribution to Ukrainians' victory as well. And I do believe that the war will not be over until Belarus is free. My dream is that Belarus will become a trusted, respected, and valued member of the European family of three nations. We will bring back hundreds of thousands of Belarusians who have been forced to escape from the country because of their repressions. And together, we will rebuild our country. This is the future that I see, and with your help, we will make it come true. There is still a long road ahead of us, but your solidarity gives us strength to go on. So thank you for your attention. I'm over. Uh, well, the floor is now open for any questions, and uh, those of you who are uh, following us online uh, can send in questions on the Q&A. Please identify your name and any organization to which you may be affiliated. Um, could I start off with the questions? Um, you have outlined uh, very clearly the human rights situation and the dangers and um, the experience of human rights defenders. Uh, you have outlined very clearly, as the media has also done, what happens to independent journalists or those who try to report independently from Belarus. What experiences, um, um, how do you, how do you get your message across within Belarus now? And what um, impact does the state control of the media have on the population's uh, understanding of what's happening in Ukraine, for example? Uh, you know, uh, since 2020, all the alternative media in our country have been ruined by the regime. But our people who, who owned this alternative media, um, some of them are in jail, some managed to flee Belarus and to restore uh, their activity in exile. So now uh, alternative media are all like uh, not in the country. But, uh, you know, thanks to internet, we have uh, so many possibilities to spread honest news to Belarus. Uh, internet is not blocked in our country, but all the alternative media are um, declared as extremists. And if a person who is reading honest news on alternative media is being detained and his mobile phone is searched, for example, and uh, you know KGB people see that he's reading this news or watching, uh, he will be sentenced for years and years in jail uh, for this. Uh, our people know how to use VPN. They uh, know they they got used to delete the history of their searches. Uh, so uh, they they uh, you know now who now know how to get access to uh, alternative uh, to honest actually news, and so we see that there is a high demand on this news, and uh, we are using all the possible means uh, like uh, YouTube, Instagram, Telegram, TikTok. It might be controversial, but it's very important for us to to use it. We understand that. There are uh, people in, in our country who maybe don't, don't know how to use internet. It's like all the generation of people or people in villages. So there is a network of volunteers in Belarus who uh, make samizdat or self-made newspapers and spread these newspapers in in, uh, in small villages, you know, to, to uh, different groups of people people uh, it's also uh, this activity is of, of course prosecuted people are sentenced to years in jail if they are uh, uh, if they are hold hot caught uh, so uh, it's dangerous but we understand how uh, how important free information is now people uh, people get information about the war in Ukraine from Ukrainian um, uh, outlets from Ukrainian media, but of course we see increasing influence of Russian uh, propaganda in Belarus, and we have to counter this propaganda. We have much less uh, possibilities, you know, to do this because on state TV, on state propaganda newspapers, you know, these narratives that Ukrainians are our enemies, that I don't know, they want to to uh, capture us is very high. Uh, but again, you know, we feel huge demand on of Belarusians on for honest information, and we uh, trying to provide uh, uh, like professional uh, point of view. But of course, we need uh, assistance for media. Uh, 
uh, and uh, that's why we are always asking European Union and uh, on national level, different countries on national level to support our uh, media, our uh, our uh, journalists, our initiatives, you know, just to to, to survive, you know, to counter the propaganda. Um, you mentioned there the, the work of the uh, transitional administration or mm -hmm. cabinet. Um, it is a problem for all uh, opposition parties who have to operate outside of their, their own countries um, that they very frequently fracture and divide. What, what do you do to try and keep you, uh, a united front on the, on the issues facing Ukraine? Or, sorry, Belarus. Sorry. Mm. I think that you know, for people who live in democratic countries and enjoy democratic institution, it's difficult to imagine that uh, how you call us opposition, it's not like parties in opposition. We actually don't have parties. Uh, you know, it's like ordinary people, you know, who uh, dared to you know to uh, to stand against Lukashenko's regime. So, uh, but we understand the necessity to. Uh, keep our unity, you know, to structurize our um, work, uh, to um, like give people understanding how democratic forces are working and, and also for our international partners. And people uh, in the, uh, people who are fighting the regime, they are, we are united because we are not concentrated around one person or one like ideology i don't know we are concentrated on the uh, democratization of Belarus. you know people uh, might have different views on how to reach this and we of course debating about this but uh, our aim is uh, it, it's not like fight between parties it's a fight against the person against lukashenko his cronies about the uh, against the dictatorial regime and everybody is important. So we, our um, uh, United Transitional Cabinet uh, is uh, uh, divided on a separate direction so forth. So those who uh, are working on uh, human, on um, social problems, on uh, national, national identity revival, on uh, sanctions, on international arena, on, uh, on issues of defense, uh, you know, a person who is uh, working in Ukraine with our military volunteers who are fighting in Ukraine. So many, many directions. There are people who are working with volunteers and activists inside Belarus. So, and if uh, any person you who have interest in some of the direction can join this particular um, uh, representative. So it's, it's easy not to quarrel, but to collaborate. And of course, we are trying to involve our, our this United Transitional Cabinet is, is not like only political structure. We are trying to involve NGOs, um, uh, initiatives, uh, different organizations into work for people to feel, you know, this unity. That it's not like perception that somebody is telling us what to do and we fulfill, uh, we can fulfill the orders. We are we we all like participating in in uh, in discussions in debates and uh, our decisions have, have to be like joined. Yeah. This, yes, you have the floor. Hi, um, Adrian Palm, uh, the Dutch ambassador uh, here in Ireland, and before Eastern Partnership ambassador and um, accredited from Warsaw as uh, Charge d'Affaires. Um, first of all, my thoughts are with all those people in prison. Uh, and I know the friends who I had when I was in Warsaw um, who are now in prison, um, whether they're from the trade unions, whether they're from human rights organizations, whether they're from the media. Um, it has really been everybody who's now in, in jail. So my thoughts are with them, especially, of course, with, with you and with your husband. Um, you talked about uh, Putin and how his control of Yellow Rush. Um, what impact does the war in Ukraine and the, the basically this, the hopeful success of the Ukrainians in the in their new offensive have on the influence of Russia in Belarus? Do you think that the uh, things will be even tightened even further, or do you feel that if Putin has to focus more on his works in in Ukraine? That that would create some space of of breathing for the Belarusian people. 
so first of all, there is a full understanding uh, in uh, among the Russian people that uh, the fate of Ukraine and fate of Belarus are intertwined. Uh, we understand that the victory of uh, Ukrainian people will uh, give uh, Belarusian people opportunity to uprise visibly again because when uh, Ukrainians wins, win, it means that uh, Putin is weakened and hence Lukashenko is weakened. And the people who are around Lukashenko, they also watching closely, you know, on which side like possible victory is, you know, and uh, I think that in, in one moment when they, they will see the defeat, defeated Kremlin, defeated like uh, uh, Russia, they will change sides like immediately, you know, so, uh, but it's, there might be a lot of scenarios, uh, changes in Belarus can happen even earlier than uh, victory, on, or victory of Ukraine, but uh, I see uh, interlink interlink, interconnection uh, between uh, moods of uh, pe pro-regime people in Belarus and uh, small victories of Ukrainians on battlefield. As only there are small counter attacks or uh, I don't know when this ship sank, Russian ship or those attack on the Crimea bridge. You know, we see how people from the nomenclature, from elites, you know, start to communicate to us. They're looking for contact. How can be useful? How can we help? Can I provide you some information? Because they, uh, in the in in case and it will happen of uh, regime structures collapse, uh, they want to be sure that they will be um, in, in in safety, safety. So that's why they want to build this bridges between themselves and democratic forces so of course there is like connection and uh, there will be time when uh, as you said putin will be too busy with his uh, losses uh, on uh, in, in ukraine and uh, he will not provide so much support to uh, lukashenko and uh, military people around lukashenko and nomenclatura will so we'll see this and uh, we'll try to, um, of course, they will try to escape responsibility. Uh, Lukashenko might again, uh, uh, might play the seesaw as he used to do many, many years. He would, he is already actually doing this. He's trying to persuade uh, the Western countries that he's peacemaker, he's not participating in this war. He's just like, uh, uh, was somewhere aside because he doesn't want, uh, uh, his boat to sink together with Russian ship, you know, but uh, this time uh, I hope that uh, uh, democratic countries uh, have already understood uh, the nature of Lukashenko and will not allow to be fooled by him again. Uh, this is a question from uh, Leanne Digny, um, researcher at the IAEA concerning sanctions, and she notes that in March of this year, the UN Secretary General called on the EU to ease sanctions against Russia and Belarus in order to ensure that Russian and Belarusian fertilizers reach developing countries. What are your own thoughts on this? Uh, we see uh, how this narrative of uh, food security uh, influence the perception of uh, sanctions. We are, as Belarusian people, understand that any uh, lift of uh, sanctions, especially on potash, uh, will harm all the attempts uh, to uh, put economic pressure on the regime. Because potash is the main source of income for to the Russian regime that it spent to support war in Ukraine. So I want you to see uh, this link between potash and deaths of people in Ukraine, potash and uh, people in prisons. Uh, Lifting sanctions on potash uh, for Belarusian regime, uh, it will not save the situation with food crisis. It's not such a huge uh, percentage, you know, of potash, but it will undermine all the all the uh, all the efforts of the democratic world, you know, to create uh, to, to put pressure on the regime. Of course, we support the idea of synchronizing sanctions between. Uh, Russia and Belarusian regime because they use each other to uh, um, uh, circumvent sanctions, but it's not the case with potash. Sanctions on potash in Russia are much weaker 
then uh, sanctions on potash in Belarus, but it shouldn't be like it, it uh, there shouldn't be derogations, you know, from uh, uh, sanction policy and uh, sanctions on regimes should be uh, like like uh, this. And as, as, again, as for sanctions, until the mechanisms and tools are developed uh, that's, that don't allow uh, Lukashenko's regime actually put into circumvent sanctions, they will not be very effective. No, uh, and uh, uh, that's why, uh, but of course, you know, new sanctions have to be imposed. Maybe it's the only working instrument of uh, democratic countries. And uh, in, in case of Belarus, for example, if now uh, discussion on economic sanctions is stacked because of this uh, derogations on potash, uh, 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 personal sanctions can be imposed freely. You know, when Belarusians who had to flee Belarus because of repressions, when they, uh, uh, relatives are in prisons and they see a judge who sentenced your, like in my case, uh, a judge who sentenced me to 15 years in jail now is working freely in one of the European cities. So, so question why? Why those propagandists, prosecutors, judges, military people who tortured Belarusians can still, uh, get access you know to to uh, democratic uh, the, to the EU countries so why uh, uh, personal sanctions don't need so much uh, effort but it means a lot you know for people because sometimes it, sometimes it seems that uh, people who uh, have has who have suffered in Belarus are suffering in, in exile as well because they don't see justice you know, for, for those people who, who made them, you know, you know to, to flee country. So they're the questions. You raise the issue, and it's related to that, um, of um, uh, prosecution of, of those violating human rights. Um, um, have you been engaged in discussions with the International Criminal Court? Uh, it, you know, we, since uh, 2020, we... Uh, uh, we raised this uh, issue that Lukashenko has to be brought to accountability for his crimes. But so as Belarus is not part of uh, Rome statute, you know, we can't uh, open like cases in ICC or ICJ, but, you know, take into, con into consideration non-conventional situation, a special mechanisms of investigation at least should be developed to bring uh, Lukashenko to accountability. You know, how few people, when they see that, you know, Lukashenko uh, broke international law, he hijacked the airplane, he orchestrated migration crisis uh, uh, on the borders. Now he is, is participating in the crime of uh, aggression against war and no response from uh, justice system, international justice system, you know, and, and, and it creates a, a, like feeling uh, among uh, people that, uh, the structures that have been developed, you know, to uh, work on these issues are uh, impotent. Uh, do you understand? Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the same as uh, the same about uh, human rights. Uh, ODIA, OSC, uh, UN structures, you know, can't do, can do nothing actually. You know, in Belarus, in dictatorial regimes, because they don't have instrument and tools. So uh, maybe it's time, you know, to uh, create something new, to work on some different uh, tools and instruments, how these organizations have to work. Uh, because we, are, we appeal to you and uh, uh, ODEA uh, many times, uh? OCODEA many times, that you have to demand access to political prisoners to see uh, the state of people who are beaten, who are tortured, who are raped, no reaction. Nothing can be done, actually. So, like, yeah, this is the questions you know I got from from Belarusian people. Or Red Cross, for example, Red Cross is international organization. So it's your task to get access to prisons where uh, you know people are, are humiliated constantly, physically, morally. Uh, you know, it's again questions from Belarusian people. When it was migration crisis on the border, Red Cross was immediately the, uh, there. Like taking care about migrants, of course, it's understandable. We fully support this. We are all people. But what about political prisoners? You know, it's your task as well. Uh, so, these are questions. 
you have the floor, this gentleman here, please. And then I think um, after that, Shona, I think, yes. So. Thank you very much. Um, Daryl Lawler, uh, Senior Researcher here at the IIA. Uh, thank you very much for being here and thank you very much for your, your presentation as well. Um, I wanted to touch on your fourth point that you mentioned, and I think you've covered a bit of it already around uh, providing a positive alternative for Belarus. Um, and I want to ask what you think the Irish government, uh, both at the level of Ireland and at the EU and the European neighbourhood, uh, can do to make Belarusian people feel uh, like they have a European choice and an alternative. Uh, so about this European uh, alternative for Belarusian people, uh, Lukashenko's regime uh, in uh, Belarus is almost 30 years. And every day, you know, they, we've been trying to persuade Belarusians that uh, Russia is the, our only like ally, big brother, and so on and so forth. And nobody is waiting uh, for you in Europe. Nobody needs you. You are like uh, Soviet Union uh, people by mentality, so don't even think about uh, Europe, NATO, you know, they are all, all, all awful. People have been brain, brainwashed for many, many years. And now, uh, and people got used, you know, to, to, to this thought. And uh, now we want to show uh, Belarusian people that we are weighted, that we are uh, part of European family of countries, that Europe is not against Belarus at all. You know, that uh, when we uh, hold reforms, when we, you know, will be on uh, on a proper position to apply for European Union, for example, uh, Europe will be ready to accept us. Now we're only to, to, talking about European perspectives because it's too early to speak about uh, participation in the European Union, but still. And uh, what has to be done in Ireland, of course, uh, can be part of this, is to st strengthen European Belarusian ties in case of Ireland, Irish European ties. On political level, uh, uh, Ireland uh, government, Irish government and the parliament are very supportive. And now we, during our meetings, we ask to uh, you know, create a group for democratic Belarus in parliament. We already uh, established such kind of relationship in 17 countries. It have never been done before. And uh, now, uh, so as I have very like uh, special feelings to Ireland, I want uh, to such group to, to be organized uh, in Ireland as well. Uh, so uh, it means that uh, people who are part of this group will keep Belarus high on agenda uh, in, in Ireland's uh, political environment. Uh, also, uh, uh, cultural uh, diplomacy. Uh, there are so much, uh, connection between uh, history of uh, Ireland and Belarus. Uh, there are plenty of uh, people uh, in our country who are playing uh, um, Celtic music. We, you just don't know about them. They are singing in Belarusian uh, language, but on Irish, in Irish style. Yeah, uh, we have poets who write in Limerick style uh, po poetry. You, you yes. know what I mean? Yeah. And if uh, we manage to ch exchange this uh, legacy, you know, to exchange our cultural um, uh, yeah, ties, it would be like we, Irish people will reopen Belarus, you know, for, for uh, themselves. Also, Ireland is a very important country uh, for Belarus because uh, when Chernobyl disaster took place, Ireland was among the first who launched this uh, Chernobyl programs and brought, uh, I think, thousands of children for vacation. Now, uh, we have thousands of children of political prisoners who had to flee country, who are departed from uh, their fathers and mothers and also suffering uh, badly, you know, this, uh, uh, these times. So uh, it's maybe um, would be very important to relaunch these programs, but in this case, programs for uh, political for children of political prisoners. It will not be a huge amount. Already, Italy, Spain, and uh, Norway uh, launched such programs, and uh, you know I think that Ireland is, should be champion in in this direction. Uh, so we are asking national level, you know, to uh, provide assistance to, uh, as I said, to our media, to our initiatives, to human rights defenders, to democratic institutions. Mm -hmm.
uh, just to, to contribute into, into our uh, common victory. You know, fight for democracy is not a local one, it's a global one. And I think those countries who already uh, like enjoy uh, democracy, uh, they, it's like more obligation of them to contribute to, uh, to those countries who want to achieve uh, uh, this democracy. And um, we are not asking to do everything instead of us. We ask you help us, you know, to survive, uh, to counter this uh, regime. We are actually, uh, we are actually fighting not only with Lukashenko, but with all um, imperialistic uh, uh, Russia to, uh, together with uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, so just uh, be helpful, be in solidarity. We ask uh, also parliamentarians and actual ordinary people who can do this. And uh, each of you here, uh, we have thousands of political prisoners. Take, we call it good parenthood over political prison. Choose one of them, just time to time, write letter to this person in prison or communicate with the family. Uh, just a uh, couple of words of support are so important. I don't know, send a present to a child or political prisoner on Christmas. It's very small efforts to you. I mean, you as, as you know, not, not you personally, but uh, it creates so much support for people. And when a person in jail gets a letter from a person in Ireland, it makes the whole week for them. They're rereading. Re 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 uh, they want to write the uh, answer. Uh, it's so important. It will take 10 minutes of your life, but uh, you will give energy to, the, to that person who is in jail because uh, administration and prisons do everything possible for people uh, feel abandoned, forgotten. You know, they want to persuade um, our, our beloved, our relatives that nobody is fighting for you. You sacrificed in vain. And our task, you know, to be the, the solidarity to show that we are with you. On the 21st of May uh, this year, there will be uh, their solidarity with, Bel uh, with the Belarusian uh, political prisoners. If you on this day tweet or make statement or uh, make interview, I don't know, whatever, you know, just to attract attention, uh, it will be uh, huge support, you know, to, uh, to our movement. Um, I know that the time is passing very quickly and I think I have three people on, on the floor who want to ask a question. So I, I'll take the three of them at the same time. Shona, would you like to go for us there? Hi, Svetlana, Shona from uh, Euronews. Um, just a quick question. You, you, you mentioned about the sanctions that they weren't working as well as they should because of loopholes. What areas are the loopholes most emerging and what can be done, obviously, to, to close them? And then just on Roman Protasevich, um, do we know about the conditions he's been held in? I know he was given eight year sentence yesterday, but just tell us a little bit about his fate. Thank you. Dear Ron Amara, member of the Institute. I was inquiring about the state of the Belarus economy and what is the material condition of the people in Belarus? Is there full employment? Is there mass unemployment? Um, can you say something about how the living conditions, material conditions of the people are being affected? Uh, hi, Donegal Bachoin from Dublin City University. Um, I was struck with what you were saying about the Irish culture in Belarus, and I had the pleasure some years ago of visiting uh, an Irish dancing school in Western Belarus in Grodna, and I was so impressed by how the fact they'd never been to Ireland, and yet they had made their own dresses and with the Celtic design, and you know they received no support from any government, not let alone Ireland, uh, and yet they were kind of carried away with their own enthusiasm. But I was also struck with what you were said in your in your address about attacks on. Belarusian culture and language uh, by the Lukashenko regime, which has now been in power for over 30 years. And I'm wondering, could you elaborate on that? And, you know, what has been done to undermine the Belarusian language and culture over the last couple of decades? And what efforts have been taken to counteract that campaign against Belarusian language and culture? Oh, it's a <laughs> Yeah, thank you for your uh, questions. First, first of all, about uh, uh, sanctions. Uh, I think that uh, all the under sanctions products uh, can be uh, can be delivered to uh, Europe despite of uh, sanctions, because it's uh, what regime is doing. For example, wood products. They uh, put sticker of Kazakhstan, for example, 
you know, the, this products have been produced in Belarus, packed in Belarus, but they put stick of Kazakhstan as if it came from Kazakhstan and deliver is, uh, is uh, to Europe. The same with the uh, oil products, for example, they change special code. I'm not very like uh, uh, in the topic, but they change the code for the product that is not under sanctions, but inside is under sanctions product. So, and, uh, you know, they have many, many schemes. Just believe me, Lukashenko uh, have been under sanctions many, many times, and they know how to, how to do this. And uh, actually uh, not so uh, attention is paid if um, under sanctions uh, products are, are coming to, uh, are coming to uh, uh, Belarus or are coming to Europe. The same as uh, uh, Russia had been uh, uh, was under sanctions for um, uh, Matsuki for sea products. And uh, suddenly Belarusian prawns appeared. You know, they brought uh, this uh, seafood from uh, Norway, from Iceland, put the seekers as if it is produced in Belarus. Yeah, we, we are growing uh, prawns and uh, shrimps in, in our country and sell it as Belarusian product. So this is how they, they are doing this. Many, many, in many uh, uh, directions. So uh, we can provide, you know, uh, all the necessary information, you know, if you need for investigation or what, we have all the proofs. Uh, as for Roman Protasevich, as, as a journalist who had been uh, kidnapped from hijacked airplane yesterday, it was caught. Uh, and uh, you know that Roman Protasevich, after he was kidnapped, uh, he started to collaborate with the regime. We can't uh, blame him for this because the methods uh, KGB is using for torturing people are awful. And uh, I think that uh, he was sure that uh, uh, regime will like save him and will not give uh, him like real time. But he was sentenced to eight years uh, in prison. There is still, there will be continuation of the story. We don't know if he will be um, Pamilovan, pardoned, or if he maybe will be pardoned in the future and it's just like a show for people or he will be sent to real prison. Uh, we will follow the situation, but to us, other journalists, 20 years and 19 years, just for doing their job, just can imagine. Uh, as for living conditions of people in Belarus, of course, uh, the, the economic situation uh, is worsening in our country, but uh, uh, look, it's not, of, it's not because of sanctions, but it's because of poor ma management. You know, uh, our people have never lived good. <clears throat> Even the times when there were no sanctions on Belarus at all, uh, people uh, got very low salaries. Uh, they couldn't travel. You know, I, I don't remember a percentage of people who are living under the level of poverty. Is it? Uh, yeah. And uh, but now uh, people who are opposing the regime became the aim uh, of this regime. And for example, wife of political prisoner for sure will be fired from uh, her job or parents of political prisoners, and they can't find a new job in Belarus. Uh, also, 25% uh, of uh, IT specialists left Belarus because of repressions, and it will, they were a huge uh, source of income for Lukashenko's regime. Best specialists in, in the medical sphere, in the educational sphere, in uh, journalistic, they also, they were, uh, sent out of Belarus, and uh, it's the, like the best brains. And uh, of course, uh, you know, there is a lack of uh, labor force, Kabochi Sili, labor force in Belarus, a uh, lack of specialists. Uh, but, uh, you know, this uh, revenge on people is much higher for Lukashenko. That's, uh, that's necessity to provide um, uh, uh, Work, uh, labor space, you know, with uh, with uh, with people. Uh, but uh, again, I want to say that uh, I have never heard from Belarusians that it's fault of Western countries, fault of sanctions that we leave uh, poor. Uh, they understand who is guilty, who is responsible, and uh, they say us that we are ready to like like to suffer uh, from from um, uh, economical not disaster, but economical hardship, decline, that, but we want to get rid of the regime so much 
that we are on your side. We want to uh, continue. Those who are in exile are fighting actually uh, for themselves and for those who stayed in Belarus because it's, it's uh, difficult to do something visible in our country. Uh, and uh, also, but we uh, we are understand that it will be huge. Uh, mm, we, a lot should will a lot should have been done in the future in economy, and we are already working on economical reforms. We are communicating with businesses uh, in different countries, just uh, explaining them what's going on now, and uh, that in future we we will be waiting for your investment. We will provide you normal uh, economic atmosphere or business atmosphere, and where you can come with your businesses and develop, given um, uh, uh, working places for persons. Now. Uh, no one um, foreign business can't feel free in Belarus because at any moment uh, the business can be nationalized, uh, can be blackmailed, and can be uh, even kicked out uh, of the country. Like uh, it has been done since 2020. So, so businesses don't feel safe in Belarus. And we won't provide such atmosphere uh, of, of uh, normal business holding. And the last question about Belarusian language. Uh, uh, Lukashenko maybe is the most pro-Soviet Union person in Belarus. He was, always was very far from everything Belarusians, you know. He uh, never spoke Belarusian language, you know. He uh, never promoted anything national. Now, he always was on the side of Russification uh, of our country. And uh, language became a political instrument, actually. Now, when, uh, when you speak Belarusian language in, Bel in Belarus, in Belarusian language, or you're reading Belarusian books, uh, uh, regime considers you, percepts you as enemy. When you speak Belarusian language in prison, there are many, um, nationalistic oriented people in prisons, you will be harshly beaten every day. You can't speak Belarusian language. And our task, and after 2020, uh, people, uh, majority of people also like were the same, like, okay, nobody speaks Belarusian language in Belarus, why should I? We studied it uh, only in schools, the same as English, like a secondary subject, you know, we spoke uh, Russian. But uh, in 2020, national identity started to revive. We, people became to be proud that we are Belarusians. People became, started to, um, uh, to, to speak Belarusian language, to study Belarusian history, because uh, it became so important uh, you know, for people. And now our task is to uh, save everything Belarusians what possible in Belarus and develop it uh, in, uh, among people in exile again because of huge um, um, huge danger of uh, using Belarusian language inside the country. That's why uh, so many Belarusian initiatives appeared. Uh, books are translated from different languages to Belarusian. Films, uh, movies uh, on Netflix also are translated into Belarusian language. Like after the war uh, in Ukraine uh, started, we saw on Netflix Ukrainian language for subtitles, for translation, and we want Belarusian language to become, you know, this for the, of the same importance. Uh, and uh, like, uh, and everything can start from from small steps. Uh, like uh, you can on, on, on national level, you can translate Irish book to Belarus and not, we can translate Belarus and book uh, to uh, Irish. Just uh, you also have troubles with language. You understand us, you had have, you have to fight for your language, uh, but it's like uh, it became a um, yeah, goal of the whole government and the whole, whole nation. Now uh, those, it's uh, Belarus and people who are defending like, their language, not government and just, uh, you know, we, our task is to, is to preserve and double and triple interest for everything Belarusians. You've been very, very generous with your time. Can I, I presume to ask two more questions, mm -hmm. but they will be quick. One is from uh, Keith Kelly, a journalism student from Dublin City University. And he asks, do you think NATO membership would be supported by Belarusians in a post-Lukashenko world? And I think this gentleman, you have, you have a question. Uh, 
Thank you, um, Michael Doyle, former EU official. Um, it's almost three years now since the stolen presidential election of 2020. Given the ongoing suppression, um, the difficult challenge of day-to-day -day life in the poor economic environment you've outlined, would you please comment on the challenge of maintaining the morale of the Belarusian population and their engagement with the democratic democratization process in that context? Thank you. You know, back in 2020, you know, we saw hundreds of thousands of people on the streets. Uh, it's the first time in the history of uh, modern Belarus when people saw each other, that people realized that we are not like alone who are thinking about that something wrong is in, in our country. It was a peak of uh, self, self, uh, some, uh, so, I, I don't know how to call it. So it, it was uh, maybe self-confidence, yeah, thank you, of, of people that we were almost sure that now we will get rid of the regime. People were so inspired by, by, by visibility, you know, by, by seeing each other. And then uh, the, uh, the repressions that took place, of course, they uh, frightened people uh, a lot. For three, four months, our uh, uh, uprising uh, was continuing. I think that at that time uh, we um, time was uh, spent uh, waste in vain by uh, European countries that we didn't see a strong and fast reaction from from Western world. But nevertheless, uh, people resistance went underground. People's mood haven't changed. People still want changes. People still want uh, our political prisoners to be released. People still don't want Lukashenko. But there are no uh, tools, you know, how to be uh, visible uh, in Belarus. We are constantly communicating with the people from the ground, with our activists, with our volunteers. Partisan movement appeared from nowhere. Nobody like uh, organized this movement. Just you know, uh, it's like grassroots uh, initiative. And I see that society is boiling. It's boiling. I mean, you, you, you know what I mean, but they don't have opportunity to, to, to show uh, themselves. And uh, people like, uh, you know, like in a safe mode, we are preparing for something. We are in very like, positive, we are energetic, but we don't want to uh, lose people in vain. Because if the, all the activists are in exile or in prisons, uh, you know, there will be no uh, people to, to fight in the future. And now people are preparing for this wind of opportunity that for sure will appear uh, for uh, Belarusians just to uprise again in huge quantity with uh, more support of democratic allies and uh, already structurized, already prepared, and uh, we will be more effective, you know. Uh, now, and uh, in this huge level of oppression, it's uh, impossible to do uh, something like uh, visible and special. But uh, you know, we we are watching closely comments of people in media. We are uh, people are communicating, building small um, structures inside Belarus. You know, just just communicating between themselves. People are gathering in uh, apartments in huge secrecy, you know, to, uh, I don't know, to, to uh, discuss political questions, to sing girls and so on, so whatever. Recently in Venus, I met um, uh, a rather old woman. She, oh, Svetlana, I'm so glad to see you. Uh, you know that in Belarus, we are pensioners. How, how it's called? Mm -hmm. You know, pensioners, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a group of pensioners in one of the small cities of Belarus, and we gather in every evening, pretending drinking a tea, but we watch an extremist uh, YouTube vlogs, and we are reading like extremist news. So we are with you, don't stop, like uh, pensioners of Belarus with you, and it inspires so much. You know, knowing that small groups of people in different in different cities, even in villages. Are continuing to meet, continue to discuss politics. That they like uh, not 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 so lonely you know, at homes, and uh, of course it gives me energy uh, to continue. You know. 
Well, with that, can I thank you for your great generosity and salute your courage and hope that we have the courage to support you, thank you. more and the people of Belarus. Thank you. Thank you.